The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Uh, working late always reminds me of my rational fear of the dark. At least the lights still work. What was that? Irony. Fire! I am the ghost of unfinished projects. I gotta call Ben. Ben, the ghost of our unfinished projects has come back to haunt us. You gotta get back to the shop right now. Let's get started. Amazing hacks. How can we make this portable? Inspired designs. I am the internet troll. Regrettable acting. Bandam hatches! Each week, Element 14's The Ben Heck Show brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. It's Halloween once again, so this week on The Ben Heck Show, we're going to be building some spooky props that you can have around your house or to use in a haunted house movie. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna start by making some automatically blinking spooky eyes. So we'll do that using some edge lit acrylic and mechanical shutters and a motor. Then we can have a timer of sorts that randomly decides when they should blink. The second thing I wanna do is make a haunted light switch prop. And this would be more of a movie prop, a light switch that goes on and off, on and off. So it was like, oh, there's a ghost turning the lights on automatically or magically so you can see the light switch move. So the goal with that would be to make something that toggles on and off remotely, probably with a key fob, and then it needs to fit into an existing power box inside of a wall. So you could pull the existing switch out when you're making your movie, stick this prop in, put the faceplate over it, and it will appear just like a normal light switch, but it can move on its own. Here's my plan for making the spooky blinking eyes. We'll take a piece of acrylic as our base, and we'll sand or gouge some eyes into it and then we'll light it from the bottom with LEDs. That way this thing is thin. We'll make some black shutters that can go down in front of the eyes and those will be attached to a spool via strings and the spool will be on a motor. We'll put small rubber bands on it so it keeps the eyes open unless the motor is pulsed. And that way we don't need an H bridge. The motor only goes one direction forward, pulls the eyes shut. Then when the motor releases, the rubber bands will open it back up again. We'll get started by mocking this up in foam core. So there's a story behind the spooky eyes idea. Um, there's this guy I knew and uh, he lived over near the Mississippi River. And so he was afraid of the legends of Mothman. And if anyone talked about Mothman, he would freak out. And so we thought, wouldn't it be funny to put like some LED eyes in the back of his car one night so he'd be driving down the road and then he'd notice them and think that Mothman was right behind him. But we also thought that might cause him to get into an accident, so we never did it. So I'm gonna start by drawing some spooky eyes. Well, these red eyes are just kind of like generic spooky red eyes, but as I mentioned, the idea came from the legend of Mothman. So uh, obviously the show is here in Wisconsin, and Mothman is this creature that allegedly I don't wanna say haunts the Mississippi, but it's usually involved with the Mississippi. It's also connected to a Native American history. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a movie about it, The Mothman Prophecies with Richard Gere and Laura Linney, who's always, you know, exciting to see in movies. Uh, yeah, I know, it's some sort of supernatural bat creature, like a giant bat with glowing red eyes and it chases cars. And I guess the premise is like, if something bad happens, it shows up. So like. When bridges collapse, it shows up. When that's true, there was actually a really bad bridge collapse in Minnesota like five years ago. And I don't know if Mothman showed up, but he probably did because it was on the Mississippi. I mean, that's got Mothman's fingerprints all over it. So the reason I went with these um, physical shutters is I want the eyes to kind of, you know, close the way eyes do. Instead of like going like, I want them to kind of go. So I need to think of a way to actually actuate this. I've got a small motor here. I think what I'll do is actually use some thread and uh, pull these down with the motor. And then I'll use rubber bands to spring them back up. So yeah, I just have a piece of foam here around the motor and it's taking up the string, pulling the eye shut. And by making a loop here, it has a little bit of variance in the distance between the center of the tacks. So we want the rubber bands to have 
basically a minimal amount of force because the motor isn't super strong. So I'm gonna put tacks at the midpoint of the eyes. So I'm also gonna make sure it's at a, uh, the same angle or a reverse angle on either side. So I'm gonna move it just like that, just so there's a, just the start of tension. So I'm gonna pull this tack just enough to pull the eyelid all the way up. Okay, that takes a lot less force. All right, I'll do the same thing on the other side. And then we'll see if the motor can move it. Okay, so I have a 50% chance of hooking the motor up wrong the first time and a 50% chance of success, which means it'll be wrong. I wasn't pessimistic until I started doing this kind of stuff. Oh, it's right, okay. All right, I'm gonna put a uh, staple here. See when you pull this, how the string pulls up. So I'm gonna put a staple at the lowest possible position, like right there. That will act as a channel for the string. I'm gonna try a few things to create the glowing eyes. This is edge lit acrylic. If you've ever seen one of those signs um, where it's a piece of glass and there's letters kind of glowing, that's uh, edge lit. They put LEDs at the bottom of it and then where you score it or rough it up, you'll see the light. So I'm gonna put a piece of transfer tape down. I'm gonna rip apart everything I built. No, no one will ever know what happened here. Now I'm gonna cut through the foam core in the shape of the eye. The time is not on your side, pot face. So the masking tape is so I can sand this and create a diffusion in the shape of an eye. You know, it always kind of gets my goat when people say that I have to use machines to do everything. That's not true. I just have the machines, so I use them. It's like, ooh, I've got a refrigerator, but I'm not gonna use it because that's cheating. <laughs> this plastic has machine edges on all four sides, and since I'm not lasering it, I need a smooth edge. I'm gonna use a blowtorch, which is kind of like a laser, but not as cool. If the edge is rough, the beam hits it and, well, it doesn't stop, but a lot of the light is, you know, bounced off. But when you flame polish it, it will go through the layer, see that? Here's it hitting a rough edge, and here's it hitting a smooth edge. Okay, I started cutting some pieces out uh, using my laser so I could make them fairly accurate, but it's basically like the foam core version. Okay, that works well. So I'm going to build it on this side as well, and then make sure the motor can pull it before I continue. All right, let's do a lighting test. Hmm, kind of dark. <laughs> With the lights out, it's kind of dark. There we go, spooky. So then when they blink, oh, I think we might need to darken the acrylic a little bit more because it looks like black acrylic, but it's actually very dark smoked acrylic. So we may have to recut those. But yeah, um, we've got some reflective uh, vinyl in the back. So yeah, the edge lighting works pretty well. It's like the monster's putting sunglasses on. That's not very scary. Okay, I'm going to attach both the strings, make sure it's working, and then we can finally add the lights and the motor and get this looking like something that could be installed for a spooky decoration. Totally spooky. All right, let's try it with both eyelids. Oh, crap. Well, I need to attach it to the spool better, but it seems like it works. It's time for a tech timeout. We've had such an overwhelming response lately to our project requests that we brought on a new person to help us. Hi, I'm Karen Corbeil. Hi, Ben. Hello, Karen. Tell us what you're going to be doing for the Ben Heck Show. I'm gonna be interacting with our audience on the Element 14 community as the Heck with Karen, as well as posting and commenting as the Ben Heck Show on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Google+. That sounds awesome. Karen is going to be the live conduit between you, our audience, and our show's production. So you can get more information about what's going on, as well as be a part of the actual show production itself. I'll be seeing you online.
I'm going to control the motor with a TIP-102, which is a Darlington transistor array. It's basically a transistor with a very high gain because they put two transistors together. Uh, like any transistor, there's a base, collector, and emitter, and base is where you control it. The collector, in this case, since this is an NPN, the collector will uh, be connected to the load, which is the motor, then the emitter will go to ground. So what happens is when you uh, send a, you know, a high signal to the transistor, that will cause it to sink the load to ground. And a PMP transistor works in the opposite way, whereas a low signal will cause it to source voltage. Okay, so I'm just gonna bolt this right in place. So this lead is the emitter. So I'm gonna connect that directly to ground. And this lead that I've bent out, that's the collector. So to run the motor, we send five volts to the motor, and then the motor returns through the collector. Then when the Darlington transistor is activated, it will allow current to flow and the motor will activate. Pretty much any time you're doing anything larger than an LED with a microcontroller, you need a buffer or a transistor, or some sort of external device to switch the higher uh, currents that you're dealing with. Because um, you can read on a data sheet, usually a pin or an IO will do maybe 20 milliamps of source or sync, which is, yeah, great for lighting LEDs, but can't do any sort of, you know, motor control or real world application with that. And that's why you have external circuitry. And I'm attaching a 10K pull down to this so that uh, just in case it's tri-state, it will still not activate. It'll only activate when the microcontroller says so. And I'm using my little AT Mega 328 board that we use so often and we're probably running low on. All right, now I'll attach power. So what I did in the code was I made it so the eyes randomly blink uh, every five to 15 seconds and the amount of time is random. And it activates the tip 102, which turns on the motor, closing the eyelids. And then while the eyelids are closed, it actually will change the color of the eyes. So there'll be a little bit of variance there. And that, that'll be nice, because it will uh, just change it up a bit. It's RGB, but it actually only changes the green and blue values, because I always want there to be some red in the eyes, so they look kind of menacing. Because the eyes turn blue, it's like, oh, look. The monster has turned good. <laughs> okay, quick overview of how I made the blinking eye Halloween effect. There are mechanical shutters that go down in front of the eyes. Uh, they have rubber bands on them, which keep them in the up position when not in use. Uh, every so often, the AVR board will pulse the tip 102, energizing the motor, which will pull the eyelids down, causing the blinking effect. That was a cool transition. Darkness falls across the land. The midnight hour is close at hand. And though you fight to stay alive, your body starts to shiver. For no mere mortal can resist the evil of the thriller. Here's my basic plan for the automatically flipping light switch. So here's what the light switch looks like from the front. The side view, this would be the outside that we see, the hero side, so to speak. Inside, there's a tab as well, and on a normal light switch, this tab opens and closes contacts. So what I wanna do instead is replace that with a cutout wheel that kinda looks like Pac-Man. So this wheel could be on a motor, it could toggle back and forth with an opening at about 60 degrees here, and that opening would push the switch up and down, and basically the motor would be stopped by the switch itself. So once Pac-Man rotates too much, you just can't go any further because the switch is all the way up or down. Um, let's start by taking apart a light switch and seeing exactly what's inside of it. I got some parts here from the hardware store. Have a faceplate, a light switch that matches even. I could so be an interior decorator. Then a plastic uh, outlet box. So this gets bolted into your wall. The nails are here because this obviously would go into a stud. And then you put this in, then you do all your drywall, then you put the plate on. So we're gonna try to make something that will hopefully fit inside of an existing uh, outlet box. So if you're making some sort of ghost movie and uh, you are you know, filming inside of a real house, 
you could, you know, take the light switch out of one of these boxes in the wall and then put the gizmo in and then remotely control it. So that's going to be our goal. Something we'll need to think about with that though is usually, if you've ever done electrical in a house, these boxes are filled with wires. It's usually a mess. So I don't know if there'll be enough room, but we'll try. All right, so we have a pretty decent amount of depth in this. Of course, this is a you know brand new box. You never know what might be in an existing house if it's any bit old. You know, there might not be any room at all, but we can use this as a good basis. So ideally, it'd be cool if the remote control switch actually turned on and off the power. Um, but if that's not feasible or safe, I'm not going to try it. So what I think we should do next is actually take apart the switch itself and see what's inside. So when the uh, switch is off, this is open and the default position is just to push forward and be closed, in which case your circuit is live. There's like some sort of rubberized post thing here. I'm not sure what that does. And there's a spring, which is sort of put onto a post. Now let's see here. So this goes into the spring and this actually pushes the circuit. And it's a good thing it's plastic so you don't get shocked. All right, so my first test here is I have this uh, printer motor and there's a Pac-Man shaped wheel on it. And I'm gonna see if that wheel will actually move the switch. So if we can't get this to actually open and close the circuit, the backup will be to at least make it a functional prop. Okay, let's give it some voltage. Oh, all right, let's reverse the voltage manually since I don't have an H bridge wired up yet. Okay, that seems like a pretty effective way to do it. Then what I was planning to do was use one of these key fob receivers. So you have a key fob like, you know, for your car and this is the receiver for it. And you can actually set up to uh, three to the 256 power combinations um, with these lines here. And it's pretty simple. You push the button and one of these four lines goes high. So you have up to four channels. So what we could possibly do is have forward and back. So use this to drive an H bridge to actually control the motor going forward and back. Okay, here's what I've rigged up for the test. We have the key fob here and it has four outputs. We're only going to use two of them. Over here is the H bridge, which consists of four transistors, two PNPs at the top, and then two NPNs at the bottom. And what you do, I've actually got the wires color coded here. If uh, these two, if this is a zero and this is a one, the motor will spin in one direction. And these blue ones, if this is a zero and this is a one, the motor will spin in the other direction. So between the H bridge and the key fob, I have a NOT gate, and that allows me to take the single bit and turn it into two bits of logic, because it's basically zero one or one zero. Since we don't have a microcontroller, I have to do this you know, with basic logic, but it should work. So if I push one button, it should go one way. Okay. Then the other button should go the other way. Beauty. And uh, yeah, I mean, this should be good enough for what we want to do. So basically, one way we'll turn the light on, one way we'll turn it off. Okay, let's go over all the parts before I put it into a case. Here's a standard light switch and it's connected to a Pac-Man shaped disc on a motor that will actually actuate it. Here's the antenna for the key fob. H bridge with a NOT gate. I put a surface mount one in place. So that filter capacitor and then finally four A batteries. So yeah, I did manage to get this small enough to fit into a single box. So if you were doing like, you know, a movie and you needed a prop of a light switch, you could put this into an existing light box. Because if you're filming in a real house, it's not a movie set, so you can't just go behind the wall and move things. So uh, yeah, let's put this together and see how it works. All right, so this is the remote control spooky light switch movie prop. I'm gonna set it down and then go trigger it remotely. No wait, it could be a scene in a spooky movie. Boom. Boom. Ah! I can't see anything. The lights are out. Oh, oh 
Oh, the lights are back on. Oh, thank God, thank God. Ah! And then the lights go out again, and then there's something behind her. For this episode's challenge, we built some spooky devices just in time for Halloween. First, we made some glowing eyes with mechanical shutters to make them blink. I feel they worked out pretty well, and it was cool that they changed color slightly with every blink. By using edge lit acrylic, we were able to light it from below, not the back, to make it thin and easy to mount in more places. I would have preferred the eyes be brighter, but they look just fine in the dark. Next, we built a light switch movie prop that can turn itself on and off via remote control. It was kind of a challenge getting everything to fit within a standard electrical box, and we ultimately weren't able to make it actually disconnect the AC. We did manage to get everything attached to the light switch itself, not the electrical box, which means you could install it in an existing wall mount box for use in a spooky movie. How would you have approached this week's builds? Have you ever made custom Halloween props before? Let us know in the Element 14 community, where you can also keep track of our upcoming builds, episodes, and special events. We'll see you next time. That's odd. Ah! What the heck is going on here? It's all dark and spooky. Felix, where are you? Ghosts? We are the ghosts of unfinished projects past. We will not leave until you make us whole. Ah, the light. Our ghostly powers diminishing. Monofilament exposed. That's right, you're the ghost of dead projects. She should stay that way, dead. Except for the automatic can crusher, which I'd still like another crack at. Oh, be bad. Only in reruns, which you can watch at element14.com forward slash TBHS. Her is a science fiction film in which Joaquin Phoenix is friends with Amy Adams, goes on a date with Olivia Wilde, and also knows Rooney Mara, but decides to date his computer. Although if you really want to be terrified, just go and look at a bathroom. So sell your Disney stock before 2020. That's our advice. At the bottom of the screen, we are not financial advisors. Or to have around your house for the holiday times. Holiday times. Do you know Wisconsin is the number one state for werewolf sightings? The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com.